back to the Cross Board Entry Podcast. Today, I am sitting down with Calgary mayoral candidate Jeff Davison. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I am so happy to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, Jeff, first question to all the candidates who come on the show. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, it, it, the easy answer is to always say, oh, my parents, right? And in, in, and in my case, like, sure, you know, my dad is a retired firefighter. He spent 33 years on the job here. Uh, you know, my mom worked in, in the, an elementary school for, for 20 plus years. But I'll tell you, you know, it, it's the conversations I have with friends. And it's the conversations I've had around, you know, the dinner table, the backyard fire. And, you know, when I ran in 2017, uh, there was A, an opportunity to go and run. We had an incumbent stepping out. But I got tired of listening to friends of mine say, you remember when Calgary used to be the place of opportunity? And they were a bit down in the dumps. You know, a lot of my friends are older and they have kids that were coming out of high school and going into university or coming out of university. And they just, we, they felt like there was no opportunity here in Calgary for them. And to me, Calgary is always the place you came for opportunity. And, and, and I thought to myself, you know, I can kind of get down in the dumps about this. I can kind of, you know, moan about what, what the challenges are and, oh, government this or government that. Or I can get involved and make a difference. And I, I chose to get involved and actually try and make a difference. You could give back in many different ways, though. You, you chose the political route. You could have chose the nonprofit organization, volunteers, but you chose politics. What was the draw of politics to you in making that decision to get involved in 2017 when you ran for Ward 6? You know, I think it, it's funny because people ask me all the time. They say, well, what's the best and worst thing about the job, right? And I think the reason I ran is, is the best thing about the job. At, at the local level, um, you help people each and every day. Right, you help solve problems. You, you know, from small to large, and and you have that sort of immediate impact on making lives better for our citizens. The downside of my job is the politics. Right, I never, I didn't get into this job to become a politician. I got into this job to get things done and to make life better for people and keep our young people here in our city and find opportunities. Because I think, you know, it doesn't take you long to go back in history and and see Calgary is in a place today that we've been in before. You know, we've had downturns in our economy. We've had a lot of people with job loss. We've had young people leaving our city. And we work to get those things back. And sometimes I think we take them for granted a little bit. Uh, and now we're in a position where we're going to have to do that again going forward. And so to me, I've just been hyper-focused on accelerating investment back into our city, thinking about how do we put people back to work in our city? How do we make life continually affordable in our city? Which is a very important aspect of why people want to come here. And, and how do we get back to being that place of open doors and open opportunity for everyone? Before we start talking about policy, I do want to talk about your entrance into the mayoral race. Uh, you were originally running for Ward 6, and then after a bit, you decided that you were going to throw your hat into the ring for uh, the top job in the city. What was that decision based on? Because some people might look at it and go, okay, you saw an opening that you might be able to win, or you saw that there was a vacuum of no ideas that you wanted to put forward at, in the mayoral's race. You know, for me, it was a number of things. I think, you know, first and foremost, I, I've really tried to, to do my job well over the last four years. So I feel like we have set the table over the past few years on the biggest recovery in Calgary's history. And at a time when we are going to have probably the largest turnover in council history here in Calgary, leadership matters. Doing what you say you're going to do and getting things done matters. Track record matters. Um, because we live at a time of very hyper-polarized politics. And at the end of the day, I just choose to believe that Calgarians are much more alike than we are different, and that we're capable of moving together and we're capable of taking our city forward. And, you know, I'm not interested in turning this place into Detroit. I have, I have three small kids at home that I want to make sure they have opportunities when they grow up in and create a city for them that they want to be in, not need to be in. And, and ultimately, it all comes down to leadership. And when you have sort of that vacuum of leadership at the top, uh, I looked around the table and I thought, geez, you know, nobody has my track record of, of actually saying the word collaboration and actually defining what it means. You know, take the event center is a good example. You know, people say all the time, well, Jeff, how did you get that done? I didn't get it done. I got 10 of my colleagues invested in a project that was all a win for us because it was a win for Calgarians. That's a good example of how you bring people together, how you collaborate, how you work together. Uh, how you not only work together with other orders of government, but with the private sector. 
it's all going to be about have you established a track record of doing those things? Because we live in a world where saying no is incredibly easy, right? You can say no to everything and 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 literally go home and sleep fine at the end of the night, right? You just you didn't do anything. Saying yes is the hard work. Getting people to come on board and say yes with you is even harder because it means you've had to do your homework. It means you have to show the work and get your colleagues invested and actually go out and have conversations with Calgarians about what, what do they desire and want and how do we achieve it? And, and to me, that all boils down to, I could have very easily been reelected in Ward 6 and, and continue to, to do things at that level. But the mayor has a job to do and it's champion the city and champion our citizens and provide new opportunities and job growth here. Uh, and and I, I didn't feel like anybody who had entered the race had the ability to do that. I have talked to Calgarians from the Ward 10 where I am, Ward, 13, Ward uh, 12 down in the corner in Southeast, Ward 1 across the city, I've talked to Calgarians. And the one thing that comes up time and time again, and you sort of touched on it there in your speech there, was they find City Hall has become dysfunctional. They find that it's not working. There is so much politics now at the municipal level that things aren't getting done. Yes, the event center is getting done. That's great. But it seems like we are now in a hyper politicized world where things are always about politics and politics and politics and not about the good of the people and moving the city forward. Mm -hmm. How do you envision your leadership bringing back proper leadership to City Hall to ensure that things get done, but also things get done together and not one side versus the other side. Yeah, I mean, the, the politics is the biggest challenge of municipal elections right now, right? I mean, I think, you know, in the same week I was called a liberal, I was told I was in the pocketbook of Jason Kenney by the same people. So I'm like, you know, people want to define you in an area that they think is convenient to their narrative all the time. The reality is, is that there's a reason why political parties aren't involved at the city level here in Calgary, right? Because if I'm elected mayor, I have to be everybody's mayor. And you know, I look at our, you, you look at our sign and everything. It's it's the four quadrants of Calgary. It's the four political colors that we have in our province. It's because you have to represent everybody. And and it boils down to just do good things for good people and make common sense decisions and stop letting the politics and the left right banter get in the way. And when we talk about dysfunction. That's what it is, right? You know, I, I'm I'm done. I'm done with the 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 hard left and the hard right battling it out between one another. It's it's the people in the middle. That's where Calgarians are, and that's what they care about is moving our city forward. And because again, I just choose to believe we're much more alike than we are different, and 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 that's an important thing to remember in politics, especially at the local level, because it's not about what party you're with. It's about, did the fire department get paid? Did my garbage get picked up on time? Are we creating new job opportunities? And you have to be able to, to, to find and define candidates that are capable of two things, security and certainty, right? If, if you talk about investment in our city and accelerating investment, investors always want those two things, right? But so do citizens, right? They, they wanna know that their elected officials, it doesn't matter who the government of the day here in Alberta are or, or federally. What matters is that we can work together with them to advance investment in Calgary because it's Calgary first for me. You, you mentioned something that I wasn't going to bring up until later on in the show, but this is the great thing about this type of interview. I go with what you say. Yeah. It's, it's um, like I'm thinking what you want me to think, you know? Exactly. You talked about how you want to be the mayor for everyone, uh, whether yeah. they be Liberal, Conservative, Green Party, NDP, whatever. But at the end of the day, there are people who are not going to vote for you. There are going to be people who disagree with you on subjects that you want to bring forward. How do you be the mayor for those who may not vote for you, but also may not agree with you on how you want to run the city? Well, I, I think you have to boil those things down at a civic level to issue-based, right? There, there's always going to be issues that people will agree with or disagree with. And um, it's okay, that's healthy for us to have, right? Because there will be other issues that those who disagree with say the event center on will agree with me on. And that's okay, that's the beauty of civic politics, right? It's not about a hard line on the left or the hard line on the right. It, it's, it's about what matters today for Calgarians it's what it's how do we get to those solutions that are benefit Calgarians? Um, because, you know, that that 
the mayor always says it best, right? When he makes his, his color purple kind of comment, right? He's, he doesn't have to be conservative. He doesn't have to be liberal. The reality is he's right. You have to be everybody's mayor and you have to be able to say, sometimes, you know, people are gonna agree with me on, on an economic stance, right? But you have to be able to address the social cause stuff that we have here in the city to address like homelessness, affordable housing, social or mental and health, uh, mental and, uh, now I'm just struggling for my own words here. Um, Mental health and addiction. Thank you. You know, those things also matter at the civic level. And so, you know, people might disagree with, you know, an economic play. You know, let's take tech, for instance, they might say, or, or the film industry. Well, Jeff, I don't agree with you, you know, trying to stand up incentives because we, we shouldn't be providing incentives to stand up government, you know, or to stand up business, private sector business. Um, and sure, they might disagree with that, but then they might agree with me on something totally different when it comes to our uh, affordable housing strategy. You, you talk, you, you, you're talking about policy, and this is the part of the show that I love. I love policy. I love going into the nitty gritty of policy. The one big thing that the next council will have to deal with is budget, 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 budget. Over the last 18 months, as much as we want this pandemic to be done, it is not. We are looking at a fourth wave here, and we are looking at potentially we're not, I'm not saying lockdown, but we're looking at potentially doing masks because I know there are some people who are saying we should have the mask mandate back. How do you envision a road to recovery for all? Because there are people struggling who are about to lose their house. They're one paycheck away, one month away from losing their house. Yeah. We have businesses who are struggling because they were open and they were closed and they're open from the provincial level. How do you envision working together with your other 14 colleagues who will be elected on October 18th to ensure everyone gets a fair shot at recovery from this pandemic, but also from the oil downturn that we had as well? Because you have to remember, Calgary has gone through not one, but two hard hit moments of global economic downturn of oil and gas and the pandemic. So how do you envision yourself doing that? It, it, you know, it's, it, it's a big challenge because I really do think that everything over the next decade from homelessness to the economy is going to be about post-COVID recovery. Um, you know, and, and you're right. I think Calgary has, in a way, been disproportionately affected. You know, everybody has globally felt the pandemic, right? We have globally felt an economic downturn. But the energy downturn has made it a bit disproportionately worse off for Calgarians than just about any other jurisdiction out there. And so it's a number of things that you have to do. Budgeting is key, right? You have to think about, I mean, even during the pandemic, by bringing in the City Save program, I helped, you know, we reduced the budget by $90 million this year and next year. We've got another $75 million of reductions. But we've kind of gotten to the point now where we're below 2013 levels of funding. And we have to also remember that Calgary has grown three times the size of Lethbridge since 2013. So budgeting is a challenge. But by looking at efficiencies and savings, uh, we were able to, even during a pandemic, issue a negative tax rate. And it's more of those efficiencies that we have to go and find. Like efficiency shouldn't be a conversation we have when every election cycle comes around. It should be ingrained in everyone at the city of Calgary because, uh, you know, it's so easy to say, oh, the city's so wasteful and our employees are wasteful. They're not, they're also taxpayers. They care about where their dollars go to. And you know, we get some of our best ideas at the city from our employees who say, here's an opportunity for savings. And I know it's an opportunity because I do the job. And, and you take those things seriously. So encouraging more efficiencies across the board is going to be kind of the direction of where we go if we're gonna try and hold sort of zeros over the next short term here, because the recovery factor of what we have is important. Competitiveness in a world of uh, you know, capital and talent being extremely mobile and they will go to the least path of resistance uh, to find jurisdictions to invest in. Remaining competitive is going to be key. And so when we think about our, uh, our non-residential tax rate, we've got to think about how do we continue to drop that rate to be more competitive with places like Edmonton. Right now, I think the, the non-res to residential is about 3.03 to one here in Calgary. In Edmonton, it's about 2.7 to one. And so trying to incrementally get some of those business taxes down so that we can be more competitive is going to be key because we have to remember that you know a lot of these small businesses in calgary have been disproportionately affected over the pandemic but what we forget in calgary all the time is that you know who are we we're entrepreneurs we're doers well that tends to mean we have a lot of small business and what it's resulted in is 
small business in the city of Calgary is the largest employer in our city. So managing and making sure the regulatory environment for small business to thrive and succeed is incredibly important to citizens here. And so that's, those are some of the things that you have to do and take into consideration when you move through with budgeting. Now, over the next 10 to 15 years, let's say our economic strategy is successful. We're successful with our downtown strategy of filling our office towers back up. Now that'll help bring that tax base back up. And I always prefer to say, let's expand our tax base, not our tax rate. So looking at new opportunities, you know, like, like the Rivers District, right? Everybody will say, well, the event center is a hockey deal, Jeff. It's just because you wanted the Flames to do this or that. It has nothing, the, the hockey deal is about this much in the, in the overall equation. It's an important facility. It's important to have a major sports franchise in your city. But what's more important is that we recognize opportunity. And Calgary is one of the only North American jurisdictions with an open available downtown landmass that's prime for development. And if we can develop there and actually stand up the entertainment and cultural district and build a tax base, well, that's a significant movement that we've made in, in growing our tax base, not our tax rate. I want to go back to a key word that you used here, and you used it a few times, efficiencies. You, you're yeah. looking at uh, the city uh, staff to look fine for efficiencies uh, in the realm of $70 million. Now, yeah. as a resident, if someone who says efficiencies, who's running for council, the first thing that I would be thinking of is, okay, what services are you going to be cutting? What services are you going to be cutting from me? Are you saying that you would be willing to cut services to find efficiencies? Or what are you talking about efficiencies? Because I think people want to know what that means in a, a Davison mayoral uh, leadership. I'll give you two examples of efficiencies. And, and just because we've been talking about small business, I'll give you one. I'll give you that one first. You know, the idea of how does government get out of the way of, you know, businesses and people and not-for-profits and community. It, it's, by, it's by removing policy, not adding policy, and ensuring that people can succeed faster. And so if you think about what we've done with the, the business advisory committee is a great example, right? People talk about, I'm going to go and remove red tape. And, uh, you know, when I'm elected, this is the way it's going to be. The reality is, is everybody says that. But then there's those of us who actually go and do it. So we've stood up a committee that has now looked at, you know, everything from restaurants to our uh, industrial land sector to say, where can we create efficiencies? And so if you think about a competitive edge again, right? In Edmonton, you can get a 50,000 square foot warehouse a development permit done in probably 90 days. In Calgary, that's 18 months. That is not a competitive advantage. So looking at how we become much more efficient as an administration to move those things faster is incredibly important. Restaurants, you know, we go out and we meet with all different industries and we whiteboard session with them to understand what are their challenges and what do we need to do as a city to help them succeed. And so one of the challenges we found with restaurants was that there were seven different categories of business licensing for restaurants. And we've now brought that down to two, right? It's, it's, it's those types of efficiencies and moving people faster that are important. But on the service side, I'm not interested in cutting services. I'm interested in investing in services that provide a great return to citizens at an affordable rate. And so sometimes it's about looking at efficiencies. And so a good example of that is some of the reorganization we've now done within the city. So a good, a good example is pathways, right? Every winter we hear about paths that, hey, Jeff, I was walking down this pathway and it's shoveled and I got to a T intersection and now the snow's piled up and there's ice everywhere. And, you know, I can't get out of my house. I can't get to work. I can't get to the bus stop, whatever that is. And then you ladder on things like, you know, as we saw last December, uh, we had multiple snow events where people were effectively trapped in their houses and we weren't doing residential snow clearing. Um, so part of it is thinking, okay, well, residential snow clearing on 9,000 kilometers of residential roads is about $13 million a year, but it's an important service that citizens want. So we've got to figure out how we prepare better for that. So I took forward a notice of motion to deal with that differently. At the same time, we looked at Paths always being, you know, a problem and, and a number of us wanted to fund up, how do we do snow removal on pathways, how do we make it more accessible and how do we use mobility as a stronger feature. So we've taken our roads department, for instance, and we're now no longer calling them roads and transportation, we're calling them mobility. And so if you think about those path challenges we had, it's because you had parks clearing one path which, you know, parks is the first to be cut and the last to be funded when there's budget challenges and you had roads clearing other paths. And it was leading to sort of this discommunication with citizens to say, well, what do you mean parks department clears these and roads clears these? Like, why don't we just do one thing or the other? And I said, well, I agree. 
So now we have the roads department. So think about it like this. The asphalt folks are now dealing with asphalt and concrete. They're going to clear all of those paths. And the green people, the parks people, they're going to deal with just the parks. And so there's no crossover of having multiple departments dealing with multiple challenges. What we've done is found a more efficient way to deliver the service at a, at, you know, at still a price point, but it's a better level of service because we now have one, one department managing it rather than two. We live in a very diverse city. Uh, you can, there is a very ethnic diversity here in northern, northwest, northeast, sorry, Calgary. Yep. Um, sometimes, I know we are talking in, in English, uh, it is the, one of the official languages of Canada, but sometimes in northeast, English is not the first language. That's right. How do you, how do you envision reaching out to communities who might not be able to do business in the English language? You know, it's funny because when we talk about diversity in our city, uh, we forget that Calgary is the third most diverse city in Canada. And we forget that there, in the last 10 years, we have welcomed citizens from over 150 countries and there's now over 120 languages spoken in Calgary. That's incredible. We have to think about the folks that come in here. Why are they coming here? Well, they're coming here because opportunity is synonymous with Calgary. Right? They come here for the same reasons that people from Saskatchewan came here 30 years ago. We're seeing an influx of people come from around the world because Calgary is seen as a welcoming place that is rich with opportunity. And we have to continue to keep it that way. And you know, again, I go back to our downtown strategy. Right? When we think about the incredible push I've had in the tech industry is because tech is not just a sector, it's across all sectors. So when we think about logistics and pharmaceuticals and we think about um, logistics and energy and uh, agriculture, technology is going to play a role in standing up and accelerating those industries here in Calgary. But primary to that is, is talent. If you don't have the talent necessary to fill the job opportunities, they will go to the places that do. And so our, the, the immigration story here in Calgary is going to continue to get bigger and bigger because, you know, if we, if we say over the next 10 to 15 years, again, are successful in those strategies of filling up our downtown and bringing job opportunity here, Calgary is going to be a city of 2 million people. And you have to think about where are those people coming from? They're not all moving from Slave Lake, right? There's, there's not enough people that can get here from there. We're looking at a major push on immigration to fill those jobs and fill those opportunities and continue to grow businesses here in Calgary. And so the way we interact isn't just about you know, again, you, you know, election times, you see a lot of people go out there and say, well, when I'm elected, well, I'm currently elected, you know, to me, I don't want to just give our, our newcomer community, uh, you know, I don't want to just encourage them to get out and vote. I want to give them a reason to vote. And by, by that, I mean, I want to get them involved in my campaign. And what are the things that matter to them as citizens? And you'll find they're often the same that matter to the people that are still here. Right. We again, we have a lot more in common as citizens here in Calgary than we do have differences. Everybody cares about the same things. It's ch the challenge we have is making sure that we communicate sometimes more on a grassroots level to, to ensure that that message is getting out. Involving conversations with our community stakeholders so that we know those messages are getting out. You know, when you're running a political campaign, you want to make sure folks from those communities are there and, and working on behalf of your team and representing you in those communities, because that's incredibly important, right? I'm, I'm well aware that I'm the middle-aged white guy running for mayor, right? Um, my I, goal... wanna, I wanna jump on that for a second yeah. because I, and it's, well, the only reason I, I'm asking you this and I've not asked any of the other candidates, the mayoral candidates that I've had on is because it literally has just come up in the news. We have seen a rise in hate crimes of, towards uh, yeah. Uh, people of uh, uh, color, of uh, minorities, when they put up election signs. Um, the narrative is not good when you have that happen in a city that is very diverse like we are. How do you envision saying, okay, you know what, we need to stamp out this racism that we have in our city and move forward? Because at the end of the day, if the narrative of the city is we're racist, it's not going to bring people to our city. Well, I mean, first and foremost, you have to have the stance of racism is not welcome in our city, period, full stop. That's it. There, there, there's no discussion. There's no negotiation on this. 
it is not welcome in our city. And it takes people standing up to do things about it. You know, I, I did a great talk with them. Um, I was at the Southwest Mosque. And, it, it, you know, again, like, like I say, I'm well aware that I'm the middle-aged white candidate running in this election. Uh, I don't need to get out to the mosques and, and to the temples and, and to, to all, you know, our different communities and talk about racism, right? It takes you about two seconds to understand that, you know, some of my best friends are Lebanese and they get treated like no person should be treated and they're born and raised Calgarians. Um, that is not acceptable in our city. And, you know, we, we have to continue to be committed to becoming anti-racist. And that means we have to have those tough conversations. And I don't need to go to places like the mosque to preach to the choir and say, well, here's all the things and oh boy, I feel bad for you and what you've gone through. They already know that. It's me going home and having that conversation with my kids about why it's not acceptable in our city and why they too should stand up for it. It's, it's about getting these conversations to the boardroom to say why it's not acceptable in our businesses and, and in our corporations across the city. It's those conversations that we have to continue to have. And when we start to feel comfortable having those conversations and we start to feel comfortable that, you know, we are united in our front against racism, well, then you start to change things. But you've got to remain committed to it. It's like a lot of things. It, you know, it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And you have to take steps to call it out where you see it. And, you know, you won't always get it right. I think, you know, people, people often get fearful of saying the wrong thing. And, yeah, that can happen. But that doesn't mean that you should condone what's going on. Before I moved to this, the city, uh, the first thing I did was I, 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 I'm a former journalist and I, I like I like I like numbers. I like stats. I like to know that I'm moving into a safe neighborhood. So mm -hmm. when I first moved here, I looked on Calgary Police Services website. I looked at their stats for the area that I was potentially moving into. And I saw that it was a relatively safe neighborhood. Most people don't do that. Most people will look at the news reports and they'll say, hey, there's gang violence in the Northeast, there's uh, drugs in the Northeast, there's a stabbing, there was an officer who was killed in the line of duty in the Northeast. So the narrative of some parts of the city is it's not safe. How do we change that narrative? Because if I'm doing my due diligence and not other people are, and I'm not saying I'm one of the few, and there are probably few people who do the same thing I do, but how do we change the narrative to make people understand that Okay, the city is a safe place to live. There are issues that do happen, but it's not just Calgary centric. Things happen in Edmonton, things happen in Regina, Brent, Vancouver. So how do we make people feel safe when the narrative is it's not? You know, we've been out talking to a lot of people at the doors and I think overwhelmingly Calgarians across the city actually do feel safe in their city. You know, are there steps we can take to, to do better? Of course, there's always steps that we want to, you know, safety, whether it's on our streets uh, or, you know, in our downtown, it, it's always going to be paramount to why people want to be here. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we do have to change that narrative a bit, because when we think about being the fourth most livable city in the world, and we think about the opportunity that we have and the people that are moving to Calgary, um, it's, it's hard to get companies and businesses to set up here. It's hard to grow your talent pool here. It's hard to do all those things if people don't feel safe. And so yeah, you have to sometimes step back to um, the basics of community and say, is, is this a place people want to be, not need to be? And, and that's the environment you have to create is that want to be. Um, but safety, I think, you know, as our city continues to grow in population is, is going to be um, more and more paramount to, to address because look, like, Crime comes when, when growth comes and, you know, things start to scale up, but that's where we just have to have a proactive stance about what is our growth going to look like here in Calgary and, and how are we going to address it? And sometimes that's going to be a budgetary conversation. Sometimes that's going to be a mental health and addiction conversation about being proactive about certain social disorder going on. Sometimes that's going to be a policing conversation about, you know, actively where do we need to start spending money on, on task forces and, and, and addressing problematic areas when they arise. But crime happens all across the city and you know talk to any police officer they'll tell you that uh you did bring up the police service and i just want to ask the question i think i already know the answer but i'm going to ask you anyway sure. um, there there was a uh 
push earlier on last year during the summer and then over the winter for uh, calls to defund the Calgary Police Services. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to, I, I, <laughs> you already answered my question, but I want to go into a little bit details because it is a yeah. topic, especially in this area that I hear a few, from time to time. Um, what is your opinion on defunding the police and how can the police services uh, better engage with our uh, by uh, the BIPOC uh, community in Northeast Calgary, but also across the city? Well, it, the policing conversation is, is a very complex conversation here in Calgary, first and foremost, right? There's a lot of things going on and, and obviously you've got you know, folks that are using the word defund on, on polar opposite ends of the political spectrum to try and create an advantage, right? And so that in itself is a bit of a challenge, right? Because, you know, on the hard right side, you know, people will say they defunded the police. Well, we didn't defund the police. Um, and you can't say people have defunded the police when you actually vote against the budget and never actually fund the police. Because if you vote against the budget, you don't actually pay the police to go to work. So, you know, it's kind of like a convenient talking point out of both sides of people's mouths. But it's a weird conversation because often when we talk about the defund movement, it moves to be a conversation about mental health and addiction versus the BIPOC members of our community that the initiative was actually about. And so there's a lot of sort of cross-threading of where things get to. Ultimately, the challenge we have as a municipality is we cannot direct the police and how they spend their budget. That comes under provincially legislated, um, under the Police Act, which is provincially legislated. And so, you know, a number of years ago, we had the charter set up where Calgary would have had certain legislative abilities to make changes happen. One of them was with policing. That got ripped up. And so now we don't have that option. And so what we're trying to do is advocate for policing reform because, it, it, you know, first and foremost, it's not about defunding. It's, it, it's about how do we right size funding into the right programming that makes policing more proactive? Because you can go out there and talk to any officer today. They're tired. They're tired of being beat up. They're tired of arresting, you know, an individual on a Monday and Thursday, they're back on the street committing the same crime. It's frustrating for them, right? And what's frustrating moreover is that the vast majority of police are good people, just like every, every business unit. They're good people doing good work. They care about our community. They care about the members they serve. Um, but it's frustrating when we get into conversations about, you know, every police officer is a bad police officer because they're not. Uh, and so we're seeing record amounts of policing uh, or police officers now resigning because they just had it with the job. They're frustrated with the, the justice system. They're frustrated with the job they're doing. Um, they're frustrated without the ability to be right-sized and, and proactively funded. They're, they're frustrated without the ability to work with municipalities to address it, you know, policing differently, whether that's through hiring practices or um, some of the programming that we have worked together on. It's, it's, it's a big issue. Right, and, and we forget that the police in Calgary are the largest budget item we have. And they're gonna to continue to be as we continue to grow. So we've gotta think about new ways that we can be much more proactive in, in effective policing together. And, and that's going to be through community conversation, whether it's through you know, talking about the defund movement, which uh, you know, on, it, on its surface was all about um, you know, BIPOC members of our community being disproportionately affected by policing all the way through to policing and proactive policing through mental health and addiction, uh, through to the justice system reforms that we've been advocating for. Uh, and it's gotta be, it's gotta be a, a wholesome conversation because any one of those things on their own is not going to solve the challenges we have today in policing. You have to be willing to be committed to solving many things with respect to policing. Um, I, I am just cautious of time here and I wanna make sure that I get the next segment in because uh, I already know what you're going to talk about when I ask the one question, but I want to talk about the green line here first. Sure. Two of the biggest infrastructure projects that the city is going to be undertaking over the next 10 years or next next term is yeah. the green line and the event center. I, I know where you stand on the event center because you were the one very much in favor of it, but I want to talk about the green line right now. There is yeah. frustration at the doors right now when I talk to people that saying, okay, it's great that we have federal funding now. It's great that we have provincial funding. It's great that everyone's at the table now but until a shovel is in the ground and it actually starts getting made i'm not believing a word politicians say because everyone's told us it's coming it's coming it's coming and i think it's been 10 years of it's coming yeah so 
Are you in favor of the green line? Are you in favor of what the money is going to right now? Because right now it's only going to 16th Ave. People in the Northwest and uh, Ward 4 want it to go up to them or Ward 3 want it to go up to them. Yeah. How do we continue the project going after we get the first line done? Well, I mean, you know, starting off, yes to the event center, but I was also yes to BMO and the Arts Commons, right? And put the financial package to get all three done when we were told, Council, you can only do one. And we worked out a system to get those three things done because they're key to our downtown strategy. They're key to economic recovery. They're key to developing our, our tax base, not our tax rate. Um, Green Line is also an integral piece of that. When we think about downtown recovery, when we think about, you know, often people will say to me, well, Green Line's just a train line. It's not, it's an arterial uh, piece of an overall transit network that as we continue to grow, will become more and more important over, over the next five decades, right? So it's not just something we're building to facilitate today, it's building things to facilitate growth in our city over the long period. It will also provide us opportunities to think about how do we actually do transit-oriented development properly, which we've never really done properly in this city before. And so thinking about these things proactively is where Green Line can, yes, it will cost a lot of money to build it, but it, it will be an advantage over the long term and it will create tax base over the long term that is more important to achieve than the spend that we're going out on. So think of Green Line as an investment. You know, when we got elected in 2017, I was always confused because I'd go to planning meetings and we'd be talking about community gardens for Green Line and I'd go to transportation meetings and we'd have talks about where the track were gonna go and what the alignment was gonna look like. And we'd go to priorities and finance committee and we'd talk about where the money was gonna be spent and how it was gonna be spent. And I remember saying to Shane Keating one day, I said, hey, you know what would move this project along faster? And he said, what? I said, a dedicated committee of council focused on Green Line, given it's our largest infrastructure spend ever. And part and parcel to that, why would we not make this a wholly owned subsidiary to actually put experts in charge of the delivery of this thing, rather than a bunch of councillors who, hey, we're great people, but we have zero expertise in building train lines. Those are the things you need to take in part and put the steps in place to. And I was proud to help stand those things up. I was proud to put some belts and suspenders around how we protect the green line and how we actually deliver it uh, and, and do what we say we're going to do with it. Uh, you know, the alignment has been set. Our, our, our goal over the next budget cycle is going to be talking to the other orders of government about how do we accelerate north? Because when we consider inflationary challenges over the next few decades, it doesn't matter if it's the event center or green line, everything is going to be affected through inflation. And so we've got to think about how are we going to continue to right size the investment and grow these opportunities going forward. And now is the time to do that, not three decades from now. So I want to pick up on that because you, you, you literally are reading my mind, but I'm taking this interview. It's great because it makes my job a lot easier. He's going to turn into a two hour podcast if you let Jeff keep talking. <laughs> well, I want, I want to know, um, Inflation happens, overruns yeah. happen. I've worked in municipalities before. I know that a project number is just a number because some things will come up. You never prepare for everything. Yes, you can budget for contingencies. You can a budget, and I'm talking about event center and the green line here. Yeah. How do you envision your leadership as mayor to ensure that we are getting the best bang for our buck and the citizens are not on the hook for a cost overrun that could be in the millions, if not another billion? Well, you, you have to take all the steps necessary to put the experts in charge, right? I mean, that's first and foremost to, the, to any good you know, project management decision is have the right people at the table who are capable of delivering the project. Making sure that, you know, again, we talked about this earlier. What do investors require? Security and certainty. What do citizens require? The same thing. Projects require the same thing. You know, part of the challenge we've had with Green Line is it's been all over the map for 10 years. And so we have now gotten to a point where the alignment is set, the funding on segment one is committed. It is now time to get it done. And we have to provide a council that has, you know, those two things in mind, security and certainty to move the project forward. It's the same with the event center. It's the same with BMO. It's the same with the arts commons. It's the same with every large scale capital project we have going on. It's remaining committed to today and the decisions that have been made because you see the benefit, because the longer you hum and haw or decide that you're going to re redirect administration to go in, you push that down the road so far where you will actually price yourself out of market doing it. 
I, I just want to talk about the event center for like two minutes before we do the wrap up here. But uh, event center is one thing that uh, I, relatively I know a little bit about. And I think there's a lot of people who are in the opinion that, hey, it's an event center. Let's bring some uh, uh, shows here. Let's bring some great trade shows here. Let's bring some yep. um, a better uh, venue for our, uh, the Calgary Flames. Why was this such an important issue for you to move forward because you seem to be the one who has been the cheerleader on this issue like Shane Keating for the Green Line you were the event center why was it such an important issue for you you know for me because I see the opportunity in expanding our tax base and I see the the development opportunity that we have and that we've talked about for decades and to me I'm done talking about it if we're going to go out and achieve it now is the time to do it and so so what we had is, is an opportunity to take a tier one convention center we're building, couple it with an event center. And now we can think about where are those large scale, you know, entertainment things that we can do and conventions that we can do together. You know, you think about how do we move from just programming 44 hockey games and a couple of concerts a year to programming 270 days of the year? How do you stand up a district that supports that where local artists can go from, you know, the startup stage to the main stage? And you start to look at the jurisdictions that have been successful in doing this, you know, not just Nashville, but Columbus or Kansas City or, you know, all these other jurisdictions across North America that have figured out that if you can actually bring a building into the community and make it a key cornerstone piece of that community, you can develop an area where people want to live, work and play. You know, building an event center in the middle of a parking lot would achieve nothing more than what we have with the saddle dome now. You know, to me, it's all about Yes, you know, we have a significant partner willing to pay 50% plus of the bill. That was an important feature to moving that building. Uh, and it would, have, would not have been possible to do so uh, without that partnership. You know, we've well, got to I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I, I'm going to play the what I've been hearing is this mm -hmm. isn't the right time. We are in an economic downturn. We have COVID-19 that's hurt us. Why push for this now? Why now? Why not wait 10 years and potentially do it then when we potentially see a recovery from the oil and gas, recovery from COVID-19? Why was it important in 2021 or beforehand, because I know you've been working on it for four years, to do yeah. it now? Well, because remember that we have been working not just for four years on this. We've been talking about it since 2005. Right. And so when was the right time to do it? Was it in 2007 when we saw a significant economic boom? You know, in a post COVID world, here's what I figured out about people. We always will crave togetherness. We will always crave engagement. We will always crave entertainment together. And so we're not building this facility for tomorrow. This facility wouldn't open till 2024 and we will be way past COVID by then. If not, we will figure out how to bring large scale events and still deal with the effects of COVID into that building. But moreover, it's not just about that one piece, right? Yes, we own the building. Yes, we own the land. Yes, we get all of our money back. It's about the ability to deliver the district, the entertainment and cultural district that we have always desired. And when I think about downtown recovery, one of the biggest challenges we have is we need more people living downtown. If you don't have things to do downtown, which by the way, we don't because we have a very corporate downtown. I mean, effectively after 5 p.m., there's nothing to do uh, without small pockets along 8th Avenue downtown. Uh, you've got to change the programming if you want people to live there. And if you, if you want to bring businesses in there, you have to have that programming and livability piece. And so to me, this is all just how do you thread all of these different strategies together and, and affect recovery here uh, in Calgary? So I, I want you to jump forward to October 19th. You were uh, mayor designate for, designate for the city of Calgary. What is priority number one on October 19th for yourself? Probably like taking a few days off with my family <laughs> and letting Mayor Nenshi, uh, you know, spend the last sort of week of his time there as, as the mayor of Calgary. Uh, you know, when you're sworn in on the 25th, it's about, you know, hitting the ground running and what do you want to achieve in the first hundred days? And the primary goal we have right now is, you know, making Calgary the place to do business again in Western Canada and, and standing that up and, and effecting a go forward execution plan on the strategies that we have set the table with over the last four years, you know, pushing forward with our economic strategy, pushing forward with our downtown recovery strategy, you know, being Calgary's uh, champion, getting out there and selling Calgary to all those other jurisdictions that we're competing against for limited investment dollars and limited you know, federal and provincial dollars for, and showing them that Calgary is the place they want to make those investments. 
I, as a business owner myself and as someone who has run many projects, you have to put metrics in place to ensure success. Mm -hmm. um, what are the metrics that you're going to put in place for yourself to measure your success in the first hundred days, first year, first term of a Davidson mayor? Well, I think, you know, you have to start thinking about uh, office space downtown. Are, are we achieving uh, our, our goal of moving from vacancy to vibrancy? And so you measure that on a per square foot basis of how many companies are coming in. You look at new job growth and opportunities coming in. Uh, you look at, you know, even some of the social side of things that we have. Have we achieved success in being more proactive with a mental health and addiction strategy? Uh, you know, wh where are those, where are all those metrics that we need to set? And what targets do we want to achieve? But you want to have achievable targets, right? I mean, we all remember we're going to end homelessness in 10 years. And, you know, 15 years later, we have not done anything to end homelessness. Um, it's, it's continuing to say things like, it's not about achieving an amount of affordable housing. It's continuing to make Calgary affordable while we achieve an affordable housing strategy at the same time. Um, but there's challenges with even that, right? I mean, you think about the federal funding for affordable housing right now. Uh, the amount of funding the feds have, and, and even in the rapid housing initiative, which by the way, Calgary didn't, we got totally bypassed on, uh, there isn't enough money in that federal pool to even solve the 15,000 units of affordable housing Calgary needs alone, let alone you know, solve the problem across the country. And so it, it's taking those incremental steps to, are we, are we moving the needle on these things? Are we creating those job opportunities? Are we creating a more affordable city? Are we delivering services that are better and more efficient at a better price point? Those are the things you have to start putting together to start measuring. Um, I feel like we could talk for hours about policy. Yeah. I feel like we could talk for hours and I feel that's what I love about this show. And it's helped you just, Have me over for a beer and let's just do that there. Hey, if I could drink cold. during chemo, I totally would, man. I totally would, <laughs> but I can't, so. Um, but on that note, I have one last question before we do our wrap up. Sure. Talk to the people of uh, the city who are listening to this, who are watching this right now. Why yeah. should you be the next city of Calgary's mayor? You know, it, it's, this is the most important election in our city's history. You have the largest turnover in council history. You have to look at candidates that have not just talked a good talk, but have actually done what they said they were going to do and track record matters. I don't just say I'm going to be a collaborative individual. I've proven I'm collaborative. I don't just say I'm going to remove dysfunction. I've, I've proven it to go from dysfunction to collaboration. It's, it's the things, it's the track record, right? It's, it's not what about gets printed in Rick Bell's column tomorrow. It's about look into the candidates. And when you look at me, I'm somebody who does what I say I'm going to do because I'm invested in this election differently. I've got three small people at home. I need my kids to grow up and have opportunity here in Calgary. And I want them to stay here, not because they need to, because they want to. And they, they, I want them to have the job opportunities they want to have. I want them to have the lifestyle they want to have. And that's gonna come by investing in our city now. And so I'm not interested in becoming Detroit. I'm not interested in cutting our budget by 25% so we can all haul our own garbage. I'm interested in moving our city forward. And I'm interested in growing and, and becoming the city that is affordable, that's focused on technology, that's focused on the path forward. And, and that's why you would elect me. I'm not interested in going backwards 30 years. And then my last question, this is just the sort of a throwaway question, but I ask it to everyone. In order to get to October 19th, in order to get to your first year in office, you need to be elected first. Yeah. Uh, while we have covered some great topics, people probably are yelling at me and saying, why did you ask them this? Why did you ask them this? So how can people reach out to your campaign, get involved, get a sign, uh, donate? How can people get involved? Well, everything through the website. I mean, first of all, jeffdavisonyyc.com. If you can take a lawn sign, if you want to volunteer in a campaign, you know, all of those things are there. We'll be releasing a whole bunch of platform information as we get through the next few weeks. But it's also come out to events. You know, we try to be accessible and, you know, we've got everything from, you know, a very diverse team to a very young team. You know, we try to, we try to listen to people out there and, and not just give people the talking point of get out to vote, giving them a reason to get out and vote. And, and so if you see us at events or you, you want to have a conversation, I want to have the conversation too. So please reach out. Um, for my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Jeff's uh, Facebook, Twitter uh, website will be in the show notes. So please check them out. Please, 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 please get educated before October 18th because this is an important election. 
get out and vote, learn who your candidates are, learn who your ward candidates are, learn who, just learn, 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 because at the end of the day, like Jeff said, this is an important election. It is the future of our city we're talking about. So get out, vote, and get educated. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It has been an honor and a pleasure to sit down and talk to you about your platform, your policies, but also your vision for the future. Thank you. Chris, it's all my pleasure. Thank you.